file, I have got it. So if you see that red uh, dot on the top left, that means yes. recording in transit. So that's no, it's recording and transcription. Okay. Okay, so that's my PDF file. I will view in You better be careful what you say. Everything is being transcribed. <laughs> okay. Is it yeah, seen now? Yeah, yeah. Full screen? Yeah, full screen we can see. I'm just moving the slide. OK. Yeah. Just uh, give me a signal when you want me to move the slides. Thank you. What is it showing now? I hope it's not showing the other window. Oh, document we can see. Oh, a yeah, document you are able to see, is it? Okay. Yeah. So I will unshare. Showing is. Yeah, he's. But he's I did. Okay, I'll unshare it for the moment. Okay, so we are at uh, six four five. So we have. Uh, how many participants so far? So eight. So do we wait for a few more minutes? Just wait for a couple of minutes. I think I think we should start. Yeah. Bharti, where do I see the Q&A box? Sir, there is a chat. Ah, OK. On the top, and yeah. there people uh, can raise their hand or uh, they can send questions, anything. Oh, OK, OK, okay. so we, we, I mean, okay, we go through that. OK, fine, thanks. Yes, sir.
Bharti, people's mics are muted, right? Uh, so uh, yes, sir. Everybody sees and okay. Un, uh, okay, so they, they go through the chat box. Okay. Huh. You can meet. Uh, I mean, uh, unmute anyone who wants to ask some questions or anything, and then again you can mute them. Should we get started? I think sure. there are a few people still joining in, but they're right. Okay. So, good evening and uh, welcome to all the uh, members present here for this INSYS we webinar uh, series 2022, which is uh, jointly organized by the Indian Structural Integrity Society together with the Center for Safety Critical Systems of uh, IIT Madras. So I have this pleasure of introducing Dr. G. Varaprasad Reddy, uh, whom I know since uh, I think uh, 2004 uh, at uh, IIT Madras. So he was a student from IG Carr who was working for his PhD program. So he's been working as a research scientist at the Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research since 2005. He has 16 years of experience on the assessment of creep fatigue interaction, uh, creep, low cycle fatigue, and thermomechanical fatigue of high temperature materials for uh, fast reactor and fusion nuclear reactors, as well as for the advanced ultra supercritical coal fired power plants. He is currently heading the creep studies section and uh, of the materials and metallurgy group of uh, IGCAR. He has received group awards. Uh, group Achievement Awards from the Department of Atomic Energy for his contribution uh, towards the indigenous development of nine chrome uh, ODS uh, steel clad tubes, uh, then high nitrogen 316 LN stainless steels, and uh, IFAC 1 stainless steel clad tubes for sodium pooled fast reactors, and uh, INRAFM steel for fusion reactor. He is also a recipient of Young Engineering Engineer Awards from the INAE and then uh, uh, INS in 2013 and Department of Atomic Energy in 2011 and a research scholarship in 2011-12 from National Research Agency of France. He has conducted collaborative research work on dislocation dynamics simulation of stage one fatigue microcrack propagation at the University of Safoy in France. He has uh, 66 journal publications in peer reviewed international journals and is an active researcher in the domain of uh, creep and fatigue interactions. And I have had the pleasure of uh, working with him when we convened the Indian, uh, I mean, the ICONS conference uh, at uh, IIT Madras in 2018. And even before that, I think we have been interacting through several IIT MIGCAR cell projects. So with these few words of introduction, now I invite uh, Dr. Varaprasad Reddy to deliver his uh, talk, uh, which is part of the INSYS webinar series 2022. The title of his talk is Development and Evaluation of Materials at IGCAR Kalpakkam for India's Mission on AUSC Coal-Fired Technology. Over to you, Dr. Varaprasad Reddy. I think you are muted. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for the introduction and a very good evening to the senior dignitaries and my dear friends and colleagues. So, uh, uh, as Dr. Raghu Prakash uh, has said, uh, I, I, am his I am a student uh, in the from 2007 onwards because I did some of his courses too. Uh, and uh, uh, I did PhD from IIT and then uh, uh, around 14 I finished. So, but during this period, I was at Isigar, but I used to have several interactions with Professor Raghu Prakash and many of the colleagues at IIT Madras. So now, uh, let me come to this presentation. So I'll just mute my video so that it may be clear for the bandwidth. Yeah, so... So my presentation is on uh, development and evaluation of materials at Isigar Kalpakam for the, our uh, AUS mission on uh, qualified technology. So this project work was taken up uh, uh, as a part of a consortium uh, collaboration between uh, uh, three mega units, uh, one DAE and uh, BHL and NTPC. 
so uh, the, each of the consortium partners have been allotted respect to uh, objectives and deliverables accordingly the activities were taken up at the respective units so today i will present the activities that were taken up at izigar kalpakkam so my schedule of presentation will give a brief introduction uh, on aus machine and aus activities at izigar uh, the materials being considered and developed at izigar with some insights into mechanical properties and development of design data yeah next slide sir so as many of you are aware that uh, there has been a push for the increase in electricity generation across the globe and there has been a, a strong impetus to the renewable energy and carbon free energy sources so apart from this uh, several countries also push for the nuclear and coal so we belong to the country where we have to push both renewable energies as well as nuclear and coal because in in our case the complete dependence on renewable energy uh, will cause intermittency in the power uh, supply uh, we need nuclear and coal why because they are like the base load power stations the base load power stations will absorb all the flexible energy requirement like for example uh, when when there is a deficient in energy generation from renewable energy the nuclear and coal can be a flexible power plants which can ramp down the power requirement and as well as ramp up the power requirement as and when there is a need so these kind of power plants are called base load power plants so as we increase the percentage of renewable energy generation in a country we should also increase the percentage generation from the base load power stations such as coal and nuclear so as far as coal is considered uh, we do have a coal fed power plants in india but the efficiency is very very less so the government has taken initiative that we should go ahead with the increase in efficiency and one of which uh, is mainly to mitigate the emissions and the uh, particulates um, uh, resulting from this coal fed power plants so as we know that coal will continue because of this energy demand the uh, and uh, the progress in the renewable energy will however takes place over uh, some more time so coal will continue to have a major share of electricity generation at least up to 2050 so in order to have a, in order to mitigate this emissions and uh, have the good environmental uh, uh, conditions we should have a clean coal technologies and uh, one of which is aosc power plant so the mitigation strategy in aosc power plant is to is mainly to increase the steam pressure and steam temperature uh, because of which you will increase efficiency and increase in efficiency will in turn reduce the Uh, amount of coal that is consumed as well as the percentage of emissions that will emanate from the power plant so uh, that is a strategy that is being adopted here mainly to increase the steam temperature and pressure as well as steam recirculation so both of them will increase the efficiency of a power plant so i can next slide so here we know that uh, uh, the critical point of water is around 22 220 bars 221 bars and at a temperature of 374 degree centigrade so the power plants in the world wide are globally defined into four categories uh, depending on the steam temperature and the pressure so when you see the subcritical power plant usually the temperatures will be less than 540 close to 540 and the pressures will be less than 220 bar that is below the critical pressure corresponding to the critical point and uh, after that we have a temperature beyond 540 and also pressures above the critical point of the water that is a beyond 220 bar pressure so they are called as supercritical power plants and uh, after this we have ultra supercritical power plants with temperatures above 600 so presently the worldwide uh, we can see that uh, all the countries have a mature technology on ultra supercritical power plants so with uh, with a operating temperature of around 600 to 620 and the steam pressures of 300 to 320 bars so that is a present mature technology globally so india also has this kind of uh, power plants in india for example as you see here typical net efficiencies and operating conditions of the plants here india has a lot of subcritical power plants of 500 megawatt electrical with a steam pressure of uh, 170 which is less than the critical point of water and when the efficiency close to 38 or even less than that so and then we have a few supercritical plants at around 590 degree uh, 560 to 590 the first temperature is 560 is a steam temperature and the 590 is called as a reheat temperature steam reheat temperature so uh, we have the supercritical power plants and recently in 2019 india has uh, installed the 660 megawatt electrical ultra supercritical power plant which is the first in india it is in uh, west bengal and it operates at a steam pressure of 270 bars and 41.5 Uh, efficiency 
whereas the proposed aoc power plant in india is about sorry it is the uh, 310 bars so 310 bars steam pressure with the temperature of uh, 710 steam and 720 reheat temperature so globally if you see the the increase in if you increase in steam temperature or pressure is uh, actually what is driving the efficiency now globally if you see the 1950s and 60s most of the power plants are only subcritical so there has been a huge demand to transit to supercritical power plants but what happened during that time uh, during the 1960s around uh, in the end of the 1960s uh, though they could establish some of the supercritical power plants but uh, the power plants were not operating at the design temperature and the pressure so there were several failures resulting not only from the operational point of view but also from the materials because that time they have been using uh, uh, austenitic stainless steel for heavy section components like for example steam headers and uh, pipes so because austenitic stainless steel as we know that it has a very high thermal coefficient of expansion and low thermal conductivity they have undergone severe fatigue cracking on the surface of the tubes and they finally led to cracking of uh, thick section components so the operators have to take a decision whether to go back to the supercritical power plants or continue with the uh, uh, subcritical so they have uh, um, uh, because of the economical uh, considerations they have gone back again to the subcritical units rather than going to supercritical but in the 1970s when the power crisis has started the people there has been again a strong demand that we should go for a subcritical supercritical power plant then they have what they have done is instead of uh, developing austenitic stainless steels they have taken the ferritic steels which were uh, you, they were using up to 560 550 degrees centigrade but now they have de- uh, after uh, 30 years around 1990s at that time so they have developed a ferritic steels which can withstand up to 620 degree centigrade so the 620 degree centigrade power plants uh, they have been operating successfully uh, from that point of uh, from 1990 onwards so it took almost like 30 years to have a transition from subcritical to the uh, ultra supercritical power plants in fact even to supercritical also so they estimated that even to develop an advanced the aus power plant it takes to it takes around 30 to 40 years that is it will it will reach around 2020 means by now there should be an advanced ultra supercritical power plant across the globe that was a prediction that time but uh, if you see globally the advanced ultra supercritical power plants were only uh, installed in a uh, like demonstration type like in europe they have a cost power plant which is a advanced ultra supercritical power plant but it's only a demonstration type not a commercial type so like that several several uh, places they have only demonstration power plant but recently china has started a aoc power plant in the in the world wide so we, in our case uh, since we uh, coal continues to be the major uh, source of energy we have to transit to aoc and this transition in our case will result in a decrease of uh, 1 million tons of co2 emissions per year with respect to subcritical unit so next slide please. so uh, as i said earlier that uh, the the mature usc technology ultra supercritical technology presently available globally is around 600 degrees centigrade and 280 steam pressure so globally there is a transition from this technology to the aoc technology but with temperatures greater than 700 like in the case of europe they target 750 us they target 760 so we target at 710 degrees centigrade similarly the pressures in our case is 310 bars whereas in the us case is 350 bars so like that there is a transition in the temperature as well as in the pressure so in the case of india we, uh, in order to initiate this technology they have taken this under national action plan on climate change so under this action plan there is a mission called ninth national mission on clean coal technologies under this technology development of aoc technology is taken as submission so for this mission uh, they have constituted principal scientific advisor as the steering head and uh, uh, the mou was signed between icgar bhn and ntpc under the principal scientific advisor's guidance and the psc office has then formulated all the objectives and deliverables for the respect to partners for example uh, to develop this 800 megawatt electrical advanced demonstration power plant with a steam pressure of 310 bar and 720 reheat temperature Icegar was ascertained with uh, uh, advanced design analysis, the materials development, and manufacturing technology. Like for example, for the products and the welding technology, uh, for several tubes and uh, rotors, and then uh, testing and evaluation. So the data and the technology that has uh, been developed at Icegar was then transferred to BHL, 
VHL was then using this technology and the data for the design, development, and manufacture of various power cycle equipment, like very huge steam pipe rotors and uh, 100 meters long uh, uh, 617 tubes. So the VHL has been using them for several farming operations and all. Similarly, they, they also been allotted system engineering and the test facility and evaluation. For example, uh, we, though we are doing testing on specimens extracted from the components, but VHL has been allotted that once the component is fabricated, the component as such has to be tested. So they, they can do this kind of testing only in the running power plants or they have to establish a separate test rigs. So for testing the rotors of 8mm diameter forgings, so they have established a rotor test rig facility in which they can do the testing of a rotor, rotating rotor at 3600 RPM, and they can probe the temperature gradients from core to surface and also the strains. Similarly, for testing the tubes and all, the NTPC has alerted in uh, um, the power plant Dadri, in which the boiler tubes were also installed in the running plants to study the steam strain of uh, fire cell corrosion uh, activities. So like that, the uh, testing is not only done on the specimens from the components, but the components as such were installed in the running plants. So th this is with respect to BHL. Now coming to NTPC. So the NTPC then will, uh, will prepare the detailed project report because they execute the project and they, uh, they operate and maintain the power plant. They have taken this role. And the testing of real life components are also being done at NTPC power plants. So the establishment of this technology will reduce our coal uh, by 5 lakh tons per year with respect to the subcritical unit. Next slide, please. So this shows the typical uh, AUC power plant uh, with the materials anchored at several locations. So as you can see on the right side, uh, 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 the furnace side, the furnace is actually there where the bottom of the furnace, you will have a core firing. So the core firing, when it generates the heat, the heat is transferred to the furnace walls. So furnace walls in general are not the solid plates, but in fact, they are the water wall membrane panels. That means it's a stack of uh, tubes with the water. As I shown here bottom, the water wall membrane panel, where the, uh, the water wall membrane panels will have a series of tubes carrying water, and the, uh, the tubes transfer heat from the furnace to the water. So the water slowly rises up the furnace walls, and uh, it gets superheated. The superheated steam enters into the rear super. You can see the pink color uh, uh, marking in the furnace at the top. So there are all the superheaters where the steam is superheated. And at the exit of the furnace, you see the reheaters. So there are all the tubes, some 50 mm OD and around 10 mm thick tubes. So in which the steam is reheated. And before the, uh, the um, exit from the furnace, the steam is reheated again at the exit side of the furnace. The reheated steam and the superheated steam, then they will reach the turbine, that is VHPT, very high pressure turbine, at a steam pressure of 310 bars and 710 degrees centigrade. When the steam expands, as the temperature and pressure drops down, again it goes back to the uh, furnace side, the reheater side. The steam gets again reheated, it will come back to the HPIP turbine side at a temperature of 720. And this is how the steam is recycled again to the IP and HP turbines. If you see the most of the materials in this cycle are ferritic steels, that is T9, T23 and T921 ferritic steels. After that, we have the stainless steels at the superheater and reheater, that is on the furnace side at the top. And then we have the alloy 617 for the rotors on the turbine rotors and also piping and 65 for the turbine casings. See, these are the typical major materials being developed for the AUSC. And the selection of materials is primarily based on material properties, formability, welding, and uh, industrial uh, capabilities and indigenization capabilities. Because even though we can target for a very high fi material, but the industry should have a capability to produce or the indigenous technology should be repeatable. So, uh, so these are all matters for the selection of materials for this high pressure equipment. And not only that, the materials that are to be selected has to be approved by the code. That means we can select only the, the uh, we can develop only those materials which are already codified. For example, uh, 617 and uh, 304 HCU are codified in ASME. So the 304 HCU stainless steel is called as Super 304H in ASME code. So that's why uh, some of the materials which are already codified in the design codes were taken for this AUSA development. 
not only in asme or any other equivalent international course the materials were chosen from this course so that you the confidence for the uh, the ntpc will increase that there is a, uh, already these materials are commercial available and volved there has been a huge experience so to build this confidence the materials were selected like that so now for this the aoc mission was executed in uh, was planned in three phases one is the pre project phase which is anchored by psc mm -hmm. office under this project under this uh, pre project phase the r and d for development of 800 megawatt was taken up complete r and d was taken up under this phase this started in 2010 so after that the phase 1 was uh, anchored by dha that is the department of heavy industry so that has supported r and d activities towards development of high temperature materials manufacturing technologies and various products and subsystems so there when igar has played a key uh, active role in the both pre project phase and phase 1 and phase 2 which will be taken up is will be anchored by ministry of power and uh, the idea is to uh, execute this project uh, in four and a half years after the power, power project gets sanctioned next slide sir so there are several challenges in this uh, activity so one is the development of materials it's not only the material but development of material in the desired product form so this is one of the major challenge so uh, So for this, uh, several materials have been targeted, right? For example, superheater at the final stages, reheater tubes in the form of boiler tubes, made up of super alloys and stainless steels was one of the tasks. And then turbine rotors and blades from nickel-based alloys, and forgings for huge steam walls from the nickel-based alloys, and also castings for the turbine casings. So uh, uh, the casing, the casing, what we are referring is actually a 40 ton casing. So which takes a huge amount of time and effort in developing this casing. Once the these products are developed, the material uh, samples were extracted from these products for the mechanical property evaluation for the design. So extensive testing has been carried out for all the tensile, cre, fatigue, cre, fatigue interaction, and fraction mechanics data for essentially for the turbine components, because we know that in the case of turbine, it is a rotating component. and no code gives the guidelines for the design for a rotating component if you see asme it doesn't give it can give a guidelines for a design of boiler pressure vessels and any other thing but it doesn't give any codified guidelines for the design of a rotating turbine components in the creep region it's a very complicated uh, task therefore what uh, uh, therefore what is decided is every country develop its own code of practice for designing the turbine rotors But uh, but design entire turbine system, as there is no code of uh, code of practice worldwide that is available common to uh, all all. So uh, Siemens will follow its own code of practice. Similarly, uh, ASME uh, US will follow its own code of practice. So similarly, the uh, our uh, India also has a, its own code of practice from DHL Haridwar. They have a design team, so they adopt their own code of practice for the turbine design. so and then uh, the fabricating each component requires some technology the fabrication technology like water wall panels and then uh, uh, we, we produce a large bending pipe large for large pipes which needs to be bended because uh, of the practical requirement so the technology for the bending of pipes was established and the dissimilar welding of turbine rotor which is a very huge task because we iziger has demonstrated the technology for 800 mm rotor forgings of two different materials and the technology was transferred to bhl for actually implementing on the actual turbine rotor then there was also a fabrication technology for huge walls uh, which is taken up by bhl next set so uh, one uh, the one challenge is the material development in the form of a component and second challenge is in the development of fabrication technology and the third challenge is uh, the testing of these components so in order to evaluate the performance of these components the boiler tubes are actually placed in a running plan so to examine its uh, service degradation or service uh, effects on the fire side corrosion that means flue gas corrosion from the coal and also steam side oxidation similarly turbine is now being tested in a turbine test rig which is established at hyderabad uh, r&d and water wall panels also is also installed in running plant in dadri ntpc power plant so once this is done a detailed design review was also carried out uh, uh, by a body which is outside the three consortium partners so separate the boiler design was done and separate turbine design was done and it was uh, the comments were addressed and the detailed document report for the completion was submitted to ministry of power next sir 
so that was the about the introduction of indian aivsc program and the uh, different uh, responsibilities of each consortium partner and the challenges involved so here uh, i'll just mention something on the material side so as we know that the transition from steels to austenitic stainless steels and then to super alloys only enable the transition from subcritical plants to the ultra supercritical and advanced ultra supercritical so without the development of materials this technology would not have evolved as you can see here the creep rupture strength of several class of steels so it shows uh, one lakh hour rupture strength as a function of temperature that is average temperature for rupture you can see here for uh, uh, if i if i want to build a power plant with ultra supercritical technology uh, operating at 620 i can now easily use 9 to 12 percent chromium uh, chrom i mean ferritic martin stick steels because the, the steels were tuned such a way that now they can withstand up to 620 degrees centigrade by adding several uh, by making several alloy changes but now uh, if, if we have, if you want to have a technology of aus at 700 degrees centigrade we need to have use essentially uh, advanced optical stainless steels as well as the super alloys now at 750 which us is following now is using a, a aus uh, that is 750 degrees centigrade they use age hardenable alloys like they transit from uh, uh yes uh, in kernel 617 to 740 now as on today their uh, their main consideration of material is seven, in kernel 740 for uh, steam pipes and boiler uh, tubing at very high temperatures next sir so basically the evolution in steam temperature and the materials they progress parallelly so several components the primary requirement like boiler tubes or reheater tubes or steam steam reheating or steam headers piping water valve every every component the primary requirement is high temperature material strength so this is what has driven the materials development and as you can see here for steam temperatures up to 540 initially they were using low alloy steels a uh, 2 quarter chrome one moly and uh, one quarter chrome 0.5 moly and then because of its poor oxidation resistance they have transited to high alloy steels made up of 9 to 12 percent chromium steels and with a operating temperature steam temperature of 566 uh, further increasing temperature to 620 and 625 they have started using austenitic stainless steels but because of the failures in the uh, thick section components they have replaced these austenitic stainless steels with a Uh, you can see in additional remarks that ferritic steels are tuned now up to 620 degrees centigrade with the E911 variants. So beyond 620, there are also advanced high strength steels, so which are now being designed in such a way that they can withstand uh, high temperatures. But for uh, but for temperatures in the range of 650 and 750 and above, we need to use nickel based super alloys, where 617 up to 720 and 740 H can go up to 750 degrees centigrade. However, equivalent materials are available globally in, in the respective countries. So, at the bottom, you can see here the typical composition of various category of steels for a supercritical power plants with about 560 degrees centigrade. Completely 100% ferritic steels were used earlier, but now with 620, which is if you take ultra supercritical power plant, here it is written as 80% ferritic steels and 20% austenitic stainless steels. But this can be made 100% ferritic steels with the available technology today on ferritic steels. In the case of AUSC for 700, the composition is written like this: around 56% will completely will be ferritic steels, and 29 to 30% will be from nickel base, and 15% from austenitic. Next slide, sir. So, in the case of Indian AUSC machine, uh, the materials and various forms were developed. That is given here on the boiler side. What was developed from Iziger side and from BHL side. So from the boiler side, you can see here 617 and 304 HCU seamless tubes were developed from, from the uh, with the R&D work done at Iziger, and 617M uh, headers with the tube studs that is also done from Iziger, and 740 from BHL, and T91 water wall membrane panels from BHL, and full scale YPs of 617 that is also from BHL. The hot bending of pipes and all they have the technology. You can see at the bottom they have. Taken a very uh, very large diameter pipe, and you can see the hot bending they have done, and they have inspected that the pipe uh, after two three iterations they could uh, uh, successfully achieve the technology without any cracking on the ID and OD side of this tube pipe. So on coming to the turbine side, uh, the Iziger has developed the six one seven and ten chrome steel forgings up to eight hundred diameter dia. 
as you can see here even 6 to 5 castings for full scale ip casing you can see on the right hand side top uh, this is a way it's a 43 ton ip casing and this is done both isigar and bhl uh, haridwar and uh, so similarly 10 ton steel forging was also prepared uh, similar to the 800 diameter forging and the turbine blades now the uh, earlier people were using nimonic 80a and 90 now for ausc it is proposed to use nimonic 105 this is a major activity from bhl r&d now isigar is now has been anchored from principal scientific advisor office that uh, the any a material equivalent to b983 that is similar to 740h should be developed so this project is currently active at isigar and it is going on next slide sir so if you see the material requirements from boiler side uh, the, you, the if you see the primary component the primary components are water wall membrane press which which is at the bottom side of the furnace they carry water and steam superheated and reheated tubes which is the top side of the furnace which carries steam and steam header where the superheated and reheated tubes are connected to the steam header which it is actually a distribution system steam distribution system which takes in steam and sends out the steam to the uh, turbine side so steam head is also a very thick section component and we have a high pressure steam piping which carries high pressure steam from boiler to the turbine the major requirements for all these components is high temperature creep strength and in the case of pipes and headers they are being heavy section component they experience fatigue loading from thermal stresses because you will have a steam inside and uh, coming into the header and again it goes out from the steam, steam header to the turbine side so because of this there will be a lot of thermal stresses acting on the header and earlier when these headers were made up of caustic stainless steel and uh, the plants have experienced significant uh, uh, turndowns because of this uh, cracking uh, in addition to this uh, two requirements superheated and reheated tubes require resistance to steam stress oxidation because they carry steam inside the tube and they also expose it to the flue gases outside the tube that is a fire side corrosion and these tubes experience throughout the lifetime by this uh, uh, the coal has some sulfur the sulfur forms alkali sulfides with the tube iron iron and they form a liquid iron alkali sulfides on the tubes and these sulfides eat away the tube uh, thickness so in order to protect from these tubes and also the water wall membrane panels they give some uh, cladding or overlaying with chromium alloys so this is being done for even water wall tubing also in the case of turbine side the components major components are the rotors hp and ip rotor and the turbine blades bolting and the high hp ip casing so rotor essentially experiences the centrifugal loads during operation and requires a creep strength as well as it requires a, a resistance against lcf and hf because of thermal stresses during start up and shut down and the blades required a resistance against the cavitation and again the steam side corrosion the uh, the fracture toughness data is required to contain the brittle cracks during transient conditions next sir so these are the materials being considered for india's aws mission so uh, not all the materials were developed some of the materials were adapted from the ultra superheated technology what is available in india now so for the first phase of superheated and reheated tubing the grade 91 and 92 steels are still used for the first stages and water wall membrane panels which are at the bottom of the furnace the grade 23 steel is used so these are the existing materials which can be straight away taken out uh, taken away i mean uh, we can use in the aus mission now the components for which the materials were developed by isigar are given below so here you can see here the final stage of superheated and reheated which carries very high pressure steam at high temperatures it is now being considered 304 su stainless steel it's basically a 18 chromium and 9 nickel steel with a 3% copper and then uh, uh, similarly for the final stage of reheated tubing at the hottest zone inconel 617 is used because it sees the temperature of around 700 the so 617 is a nickel based super alloy with a 22% chromium uh, 13 cobalt and 9 moly even hp ip turbine rotors are also made from 617 but in the form of forgings now a uh, worldwide if you see the aus technology people use only monolithic rotor that means the entire rotor is made up of a single material but in the case of indian aivsc it was a, a decision was taken that uh, this will increase because that single monolithic rotor will increase the overall price of the rotor so the from economic considerations uh, bimetallic rotor was taken into account in the indian aivsc program where there will be a weldment between the 617 rotor because 617 rotor is essentially used in hp turbine and ip turbine but lp turbine is made up of 10 chrome steel 
so therefore there will be a well join between uh, uh, 10 chrome steel rotor and uh, 617 mm rotor which are of huge diameter like 800 mm to the 1 meter diameter so the technology for the joining these two is a is a challenge similarly the turbine casing also we have is cast 625 for hp and ip cast 625 we use and uh, this 625 is also nickel based super alloy with uh, similar to the 617 with around 58 nickel chromium and moly and here iron niobium aluminum tantalum added for strengthening from the precipitates now the 625 also we have uh, it is also joined with the 10 chrome cast because on the uh, at the low temperatures 10 chrome steel is used and high temperature 625 used therefore dissimilar welding is also inevitable in the case of casing so for the, yeah so these are the major activities taken up by tiziger so development of materials and fabrication technologies and also the welding consumables and procedural qualification so and then uh, mechanical properties of various types lcf tensile creep fraction mechanics creepetic crack growth and corrosion studies were taken up on steam sign fight sign non destructive evaluation inspection damage and residual stress measurements microscopic characterization and design data and also the iziger also initiated round robin testing program with various academic institutes like nits iits iisc and csr labs in india and mpa germany yes sir next so let us come to the uh, brief on development of these materials uh, the 304hc tube the specification was made from whatever is existing in asme because this is a well commercially available composition but in the indian scenario what was done is the the, uh, the range of the contents in case of some of the materials were narrowed down instead of a broad range the range was narrowed down and uh, uh, the, the elements were restricted to the lower size range lower ranges so for example this this narrowing has, done, has resulted in a good improvement in the mechanical properties and this has also resulted in development of 52 mm od and 9.5 voltic tubes so one of the challenge was to uh, the uh, this kind of tubes were exhibiting cracks in while testing because of the coarse primary carbides so the remedy was to use a suitable solution yielding temperature and time so for this at 1270 degrees centigrade where two hours was identified as a final uh, key treatment for this the so tube processing schedules were then optimized to produce this successfully the seamless tubes of uh, 52 mm body thick and uh, 52 mm body and 9.5 meter uh, 9.5 mm wall thickness next sir. so the material is about 30 micron grain size and the precipitates are mainly niobium carbides and m236 but on aging it will develop additional fine uh, carbides of niobium and m236 and this material is essentially a precipitation strength and stainless steel and which sustains the uh, which provides the strength at high temperatures so basically if you see in the first figure you can see uh, fine copper precipitate with a 3% copper it has so during aging the copper comes out of the matrix and it forms very nano scale even this precipitates are stable up to 10000 hours and it will not go beyond 30 nanometers so such a kind of fine precipitates provide high temperature strength at the required temperatures even in the creep during creep also we found that this precipitate enormously do the uh, have the interactions with the dislocation movement and enhance the strength of the material next sir similarly 617 tube in the six, in the case of 617 tube uh, most of the elements were narrowed down to have the uniformity in the properties across the tube because the asme composition has a broad range of elements uh, it leads to a difference in uh, properties at several locations but uh, when we narrowed down the gradients have come down and here the final solution heat treatment is kept at 1170 for 10 degrees and is the first time that uh, indigenously this 9.5 meter long tubes were produced at nfc with the help of mithani the material was produced at mithani and it was uh, uh, the seamless tubes were pro uh, processed at nfc so all these processing stages typically involve uh, hot extrusion uh, i mean hot um, hot extrusion and then um, a cold pilgrim uh, with intermediate heat treatments next sir similarly the 617 forgings were produced at sangvi uh, sangvi forgings at vadodara and uh, here uh, uh, you can see here the involves first casting followed by hot forging and then uh, finally we got about 800 mm diameter forgings and from these forgings we have evaluated the properties from the center of the forging as well as periphery of the forging at several locations 
so here 617 is also uh, has a uh, but this forging has a microstructural gradient for example at periphery we have a, a very fine grains around 110 micron at the core we have about uh, 230 micron grain size with some variation and this material is essential as solid solution strength and material but it gets strengthened during exposure high temperature exposure next sir. So for the uh, in order to develop this tube, it's a, for six one seven tubes. It's a, it's essential to identify the processing conditions during uh, hot rolling and or uh, hot extrusion. So for so it's necessary to identify the temperature and strain rate domain from the laboratory test. So this shows the processing processing map between the logarithmic strain rate and the temperature, where several tests were conducted to establish this map, and it, various domains were identified to to understand which region will provide a higher efficiency. so what we observed is the region c and d they provide a safe domain for the processing of 617 tubes and finally the materials were produced with, with this temperature range the most suitable domain is around uh, 1183 to 1523 kelvin and strain rate range of 0.01 to 0.2 per second so with this the efficiency was achieved around 40% the tubes were also successfully produced without any cracks next sir now in the case of cas 65 for casings uh, because they, uh, before we go for producing the final component what they have done is uh, the casing design was conducted in the casing design various thickness of the com various thickness regions were identified in the actual casing so uh, in order to simulate that the stepped block was produced and uh, the thickness and the width of the, each of the step covers the entire rotor casing uh, dimensions so that uh, it, it is essentially to understand how this uh, uh, casting behavior of the material varies so they produce for step block so based on the step block evaluation um, and nd inspection they have gone for the actual rotor ip casing casting so this is essentially again a nickel based super alloy uh, but uh, in the uh, in comparison to asme uh, in indian version we have added aluminum and titanium this is one of the main change and the second one is we restricted the iron and silicon because these elements are found to promote the lava phase formation which are, which is essentially brittle and leads to the embrittlement so we we made major changes in the case of 625 and as you can see here the you can see the dendrites the black regions are interdendritic regions where you have a precipitates within that uh, as well as a random distribution of the primary carbides now the grain size in the 625 we observed is uh, depending on the location we have seen from 1 to 2.5 mm you can imagine it's a very big grain size in the case of cas 625 next sir so now i'll present some of the mechanical properties uh, uh, the uh, i start with the tensile tensile properties here you can see that uh, yield strength variation as a function of temperature and uts variation as a function of temperature and uh, the data generated for the 617m are compared with the asme data the 617 bias values and vdtu germany data we can see here that indigenous material possess sufficient strength properties and this has enabled the design very easy for them right so and not only this even it shows a very good improvement in the strength because the composition is very narrow Uh, it also retains a ductility above 50% in the temperature range of the room temperature to about 7, 720 kelvin 750 kelvin 750 degrees centigrade so similarly the same thing was also carried out for the forging that is uh, from the core we have taken some samples and the periphery that is p we have taken the samples from both sides and we have seen that the strength in the case of forging is uh, poor at the core but good at the periphery but Uh, so we want to see that uh, which data to be taken for the design so what we have done is uh, next slide sir so what we have done is we have generated the design data as per the asme section 8 division 1 uh, as per the guideline shown here uts ys and uh, for the room temperature as well as high temperature so four factors were applied so all these four factors were applied to the data obtained from the two types of forging so 200 mm diameter forging and 800 mm diameter forging so what you see here is the bottom one is asme curve design curve for the alloy 617m only for the in the non creep region so uh, and uh, the above curve shows uh, the topmost is for the 617m tube and the other four curves are for the 200 mm core and um, 800 mm dia forging as you can see here the data of forging for the core is though poor but it is well above the asme design curve of 617 so in the presently we are using only the data obtained from the core that is the green color data 
so it must be emphasized that the 617 tubes permits higher allowable stresses and in the case of forge allowable stresses have to be based on strength properties from the forging core next one sir so in the case of cast 65 we have observed some anomalies so because it's a cast structure and grain size is scales in 2.5 mm and some cases close to 4 also so when the casting is not done properly it, it is possible that some grains grow very very large so here we can see here uh, the first figure shows on the left top that uh, uh, ys and uts values so ys values are close to the asme values but uts values are not close to the asme it is well below the asme so this indicates that the casting has uh, significant uh, 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 strength uh, strength problem so this arises because of uh, uh, porosity as well as the grain size as you can see here in some of the specimens uh, we, uh, when we tested a temperature of 550 we can see that uh, undulations on the gauge length deformation gauge length you can see a lot of uh, uh, crescent thrust in the deformation zone and the specimen which has uh, completely deformed at one location that means it becomes elliptical from circular to elliptical the cross section no longer remains a circular but it becomes a elliptical configuration uh, after deformation that too it will uh, it doesn't fail at that location but it, it fails at a location where you have a higher cross section so these are the kind certain kind of anomalies which we observed in the case of cas65 because if the porosity is not controlled in fact even if it is controlled and because of the grain size of around 2.5 mm a testing a small diameter specimen of 5 mm will lead to this kind of anomalies it will because the deformation completely gets uh, concentrated in one particular grain that rotates and produces the rumples on the sample surfaces next slide sir so let, let, let me present the creep properties here so uh, the first graph shows the creep cost of 304 hcu because it's a preparation strength and material the prime d is very short and essentially it deforms by secondary and tertiary creep reason and uh, the present material what we developed is around 30 microns and uh, we also studied whether the grain size has any influence on the creep properties so the uh, the the figure on the right hand side shows the rupture length as a function of grain size as you can see here We st- we when we we investigated from 10 microns to 180 micron grains how the creep properties vary. So we found that 30 microns the cube which was produced at NFC produces the has the highest life compared to the other uh, grain sizes. So we we observed two cases here in the case that is category A that is less than 30 microns. What we have observed is the material essentially fails by transgranular mode. but it is assisted by the de- uh, decoations from the precipitate and matrix or precipitate and the grain boundary decoations whereas in the category b the sample is essentially failed by transgranular fracture driven by the grain boundary sliding displacements because in the case of 60 and 180 most of the precipitates are within the grain so the grain boundary is also having precipitate but the density is very less so it is able to slide and lead to grain boundary sliding displacements and that led to drop in life beyond 30 microns so the whatever tube that was produced at 30 microns is good in fact uh, from our from iziger side so all the cows we also developed some models modified the well known wilshire and evans theta projection approach uh, the, this equation now fits very well a various profiles of the creep cows the earlier versions will because uh, theta projection approach will essentially fit creep cows having a parabolic shape of primary and parabolic shape of tertiary but the key equation that is proposed here fits many of the creep cows of various uh, profiles so and we also developed the grain size modified cdm approach because most of the continuum damage mechanics approach considers the damage from precipitate and damage physically but there is no grain size effect in many of the models so we also developed grain size modified um, grain size modified cdm approach and we could predict many of these creep cows although it is not presented here so then we started developing the uh, how to design the this material segenistic creep so there are two ways one is to use asme section 2 guidelines for allowable stress for 10 per 5 hours or asme section 3 subsection nh so here the advantage of subsection nh is that we can get the allowable stress as a function of time like 30 hours 50000 hours or 70000 hours up to 1 lakh hours we can generate from the asme section nh but section 2d it allows the calculation of allowable stress only for 10 per 5 hours so first we started developing data using asme section nh so as per this section the allowable stress for the creep should be minimum of these three components that is 100% of the stress average stress to cause 1% total strain or 80% of the stress 
minimum stress to cause onset of tertiary creep or 60 percent for the rupture stress so we, we evaluated all these three components for example as shown here is one percent total strain the total strain includes here elastic plastic and the creep strain as per the code elastic has to be evaluated using Young's modulus and plastic strain using uh, typical formulation so then creep strain is estimated because from the primary and the secondary it, it doesn't enter into the tertiary so we have to we have to essentially take the data from the primary and secondary creep flows and fit the data to the equations given here so with this we'll be able to calculate the creep strain now based on these three components we have generated the isochronous stress strain curves as you can see here it's essentially the applied stress that is creep stress versus the total strain the total strain includes elastic plastic and the creep as you can see here at a zero hour is only a tensile curve and after that whatever is given includes the creep component and you can see that at any given strain you can see the stress realization essentially because of the creep contribution now we have calculated for, for up to one lakh hour what is the stress to reach one percent total strain at each temperature so next step. Similarly, we have done the same thing for the average stress required to rupture and average stress required to the onset of tertiary creep. So we have calculated up to one lakh hour all these stresses and these stresses were then used to predict the minimum curve. Next slide. Sir. So here it shows the all the stresses that were developed like uh, the first two lines corresponds to the uh, average stress to uh, rupture and average stress to the 1% total strain. And uh, th these are the average values. Then we have to develop the minimum rupture stress values by applying some factor. Then it gives the blue color solid lines and pink color triangular lines. And the black line indicates the 1% total strain curve. So the allowable stress should be the minimum of these three curves. So that gives the data or, uh, which is given in the uh, red, red, red line. So this is the typically the allowable design curve for the 304 HCSS. Then any, any stresses to be used should be based on this design curve, the service stresses. Similarly, we could establish the, the curves similarly up to 750 degrees centigrade. Now, in all the cases, as you can see here, the, the red line at higher uh, from 10,000 hours to 1 lakh hour, you can see that the red line matches with the pink line. That is the stress to rupture. So in most of the cases, for many of the materials, the allowable stress after certain duration, what is, what is essentially governed is only stress to rupture is what governs the allowable stress. We know that there are three criteria, 1% total strain criteria, onset to tertiary, and then stress to rupture. Among these three criteria, the average stress to rupture is what governs the allowable stress. That's what we observed in stainless steels, also in uh, super alloys also. Next slide, sir. So then, uh, so the allowable curve, whatever it curves we are showing here, at 923, 97, 1023, are the allowable stresses derived from A section 3 and H. Whereas the horizontal lines, whatever you are seeing here, that is, uh, uh, that the uh, values are derived for 83 MPA at 923, 52 MPA at 973, and 33 MPA at 1023 Kelvin. These are derived by the same procedure. The procedure followed earlier is for also followed for the section 2D, and we obtain the values like this. And the values below that you can see that the ASME values, they are very, uh, whatever the values that material has shown, they're very close to the ASME and slightly above that. So this shows that that indigenously developed 304 HCU exhibits allowable stress values in par with the ASME codes. Next slide. So since we understood that in the allowable stress criteria, what we found is the stress to rupture is what governs the allowable stresses. So what we have done is then we have taken directly the uh, allowable stress to rupture and we compared all the data generated on 304 HC stainless steel and weld joints and we superimposed on the pink data, what is shown here. And we, we found that the data falls well in line with the uh, the average stress of the 304 HCU codified in ASME as well as codified in VDTU data. We can see here that both well joints and the base metal both are in line with uh, process rupture lights in par with the literature as well as ASME data. And this indicates that the well joint shows uh, no reduction in life, but it shows a reduction factor close to or above the one. That means well strength reduction factor is close to one, which is very good. In fact. Next slide, sir. So similarly, we have done the same exercise for 617 and we superimposed our data generated on 617M on the ASME average data, which is the, um, the purple color stars. 
So you can see that both the well joined data as well as uh, base metal data falls uh, well uh, above the average data of the ASME. And the, here also we can see that the well strength reduction was not there, and we, we can assume that well strength reduction factor is close to one. In general, for ferritic steels, the well strength reduction factor is around 0.7 to 0.8. That means the data falls below this line. But in the case of 617 and 304 HCU, the, we assume in the design the well strength reduction factor is one because of this uh, good strength properties of the tubes. Next. And in fact, here we can see here that uh, for 617, whatever is shown here also, the LMP constant we have chosen as 17.45. This actually we have generated this constant from the for the tube also here also. The LMP constant comes around 17.5 from the test conducted at Isiger. We use some approach to obtain this constant. And what we found is ASME also gives uh, close to 7.53 as their LMP constant for this nickel based superalloy. Next slide. Sir. But in the case of forging, what we found is the, the behavior at core and periphery are not same. I, as you can see in the table, for a given temperature and stress level, the rupture life in the periphery is uh, is higher than that in the core. And we presume that this difference will be much higher at lower stress levels. Therefore, the design is based only on the rupture lives obtained at the core, that is the weakest zone. So this data is taken and this data is compared again with the design course. And we found that the core data itself is falling above the average data of ASME, special metals and VD2 Germany. So, uh, so we found that the, the developer forging also meets the design requirement of the component. Next slide. So in the case of 6 to 5, so we, uh, the 6 to 5, the, the main difference between the earlier creep course and 6 to 5 is that the material essentially possesses primary and secondary, but tertiary is very short in these materials. This is because the CAS 625 has several defects, though the moment it reaches tertiary within a few thousand hours, it, it, it fails. So, however, design is based on the primary and secondary. So, therefore, uh, 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 we have taken those data for the generation of design data. So, here what we found is uh, when we uh, there is no data available in the ASME course for 6 to 5. ASME gives code data for uh, broad products, but not the cast products. So, we have taken the special metals data, uh, that is a broad data, and we have seen how much degradation we could see in the cast 6 to 5. So as you see on the right hand side, we, uh, we can see about a 25% drop in the stress when we use the CAS 65 data compared to the broad data. So accordingly, we used this uh, factor in the design that uh, uh, in the case of lack of 65 data, a 25% draw, 25% uh, reduction in raw data will, would help the design of the CAS 65. In fact, bottom figure on the left hand side, you can see that Several data points all superimposed from all the uh, labs in India. That means we have all institutes from BHL, NTPC, and several institutes. And we also investigated this creep properties on three different heats. We imported two heats from Ger one from Germany and one from uh, UK, and one was produced indigenously at Nithani. So all the heats were uh, uh, shown very good creep properties. And in fact, in the Mithani heat, we have. Uh, uh, had a close chemistry uh, over the imported heats and that have shown the improved properties of Midani heat. Next. Sir. So that ends with the creep properties. And uh, uh, as you can see there, the, the developed materials possess sufficient creep strength. And uh, what we have to use is, in the case of forging, only core data has to be used. And in the case of casting also, we found the same difference. The casting center has a poor properties and casting periphery has a, a good properties. So the design is based on the casting properties, based on the center of the casting, the uh, tensile creep and uh, fatigue also. So now uh, when we see the low cycle fatigue properties, as we see that uh, uh, the components are subject to HCF as well as LCF, but there is a small difference that uh, the loads in the case of HCFs are slightly below the YS, whereas LCF strains are slightly above the yield point, that is 0.2% plastic strain. So above that, the LCF strength, it ranges from 0.25 to 1% strength. So most of the cycles are cycled between within this range. In practically, the strains, uh, localized strains because of thermal stresses will not exceed more than 0.3 to 0.4%. Essentially, the most of the strains will be close to 0.25%. And in the case of transients, it may reach 0.4%. But in the laboratory, we investigate up to 1% strains in the case of LCF by subjecting the material to strain cycling. 
now uh, we cannot use hcf data in some cases because for example you can see in the case here when there is no defect you can straight away say that it is uh, uh, applied stress is less than yield strength so it shows infinite life in some cases but it's not the same case in the case of a component which has a defects like uh, uh, stress concentration sites or rapid changes in cross section because the local sites develop a localized plastic strains with a circular hysteresis loops when the applied stress is cyclic in nature so because of this uh, in the case one and case two even though you apply same stress and if you predict the life from the high cycle fatigue diagram that is the bottom one you can see uh, sn curve for the same applied stress you will get the same life in both the for both the case a and case b but for the case b essentially we have localized deformation so we should use a, a strain life curves rather than sn curves so strain life curves essentially are generated to address this kind of localized strain uh, development under cyclic loading next sir so for this reason we have taken up the task on low cycle fatigue studies and several components so here it shows for typically the cyclic stress evolution for a 617 forge the material was subjected to a strain cycling between uh, uh, plus or minus 0.6% uh, strain amplitude as you can see the material behavior is not same at all the temperatures but it shows a different uh, behavior like room temperature it shows continuous increase and quasi softening and saturation at high temperatures it shows a secondary hardening essentially attributed to uh, some precipitation effects during the deformation so similarly we we have seen the same thing in the cas 65 also here you may notice that uh, the first uh, the, uh, the stress is normalized with the first cycle stress now you can see that for the first cycle and the uh, cycle that is at the end the almost two times increase in uh, hardness and increase in strength you can notice because of cyclic hardening that comes because of dynamic strainizing and dislocation precipitate interactions uh, so uh, for, from this data we have generated the design curve but to generate the design curve what we have done is we have applied a factor of 2 on total strain range that's on y axis the total strain range we have applied a factor of 2 and on the x axis the number of cycles is placed here number of allowable cycles on the x axis we have applied a factor of 20 so by applying these two factors we will get two two design curves the lower of the design curve is uh, taken into consideration for design here you can see the asme design curve is a dotted line and the design curve generated based on these guidelines is the solid uh, curve it is well above the asme line and which again substantiates that uh, the material has a good lcf properties next one sir similarly for the creep fatigue interaction when we know that when we go from the Uh, strain cycling you may know the time sir uh, do i have time uh, yeah please proceed please proceed yeah yes yeah, sir yeah so uh, when we transit from uh, continuous cycling to a creep fatigue hole like uh, you have a strain ramp followed by a hole again ramp down a ramp up and followed by a hole when you have this kind of creep fatigue loading where the hole period centered you creep essentially your loops will change from a typical loop to a you can see red color hysteresis loop there is a, a downward uh, stress drop indicating that the stress relaxation is taking place during the strain holes and that you can see here when you zoom it you can see the stress relaxes rela relaxes at a particular rate and this stress relaxation you can convert to a strain relaxation by using this formulation Uh, we we know that uh, we are holding at a constant strain so total strain is zero so elastic plastic will become zero now how the plastic strain is developing because of the conversion of elastic strain to the plastic strain so this inelastic strain you can calculate how much it is accommodating during this fold and this we will found, we found that this relaxation rates during this fold period ranges from less than 10 power minus 5 per second and this is what usually leads to development of creep damage in the creep fatigue damage creep fatigue folds we we have seen the relaxation rates up to 10 power minus 10 which is a, uh, typically observed in many of the materials in the in the case of creep next slide sir so then we investigated creep properties of i presented for one of the material here 617 well joints and the 617 uh, base material uh, 617 well joints with and without uh, hold time so you can see typically the curves doesn't show any difference from the conventional curves typical regular hardening followed by reaching peak and followed by softening but the difference is that with increase in hold your life comes down 
and uh, what we observed is in the case of uh, this material tensile holes are found to be detrimental you can see on the left hand side bottom that fatigue life fatigue life the blue color data indicates the tensile hole the left hand side the solid space uh, whereas the red color triangles indicate the compression data on the left hand side so you can see that compression holes gives good life compared to the tensile holes because the tensile holes are more detrimental for the creep and uh, by taking this data what we have done is we have generated the creep fatigue interaction diagram uh, hello ah hello yeah are yes, you there uh, can you hear yeah 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 can you hear yes yes so this is essentially a plot between the creep damage and the fatigue damage the creep damage is calculated from the equation shown in the previous slide where you you can calculate the inelastic strain rate during the hold so once you calculate the inelastic strain rates you can also calculate the creep damage that is incurred during the hold so that creep damage is plotted on the y axis and in the in the x axis we plot the fatigue damage that is the number of cycles in the cfi failure divided by the number of cycles in the pure fatigue so this cfa diagram is plotted on the log log scale that's why it comes like this the first line which shows a smooth transition is a linear damage summation where, 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 whereas in the case of second one where you see a small kink is a creep fatigue interaction diagram asm creep fatigue interaction diagram with a creep damage of 0.1 and fatigue damage of 0.1 we can see here most of the data generated on the specimen lies above this asm creep fatigue interaction diagram indicating that the material has a good creep fatigue interaction resistance however it is also required to check at very very low strain amplitudes this creep fatigue interaction uh, damage i have seen from ornl they have done uh, several uh, uh, tests on 617 and they found that uh, the 617 has a sufficient resistance and they use a 0.2 0.2 as a, a limit uh, as a lower limit of the creep fatigue damage whereas asme gives 0.1 and 0.1 much conservative so we also found that uh, in our case 0.1 0.1 seems to be a reasonable ap approach next sir so then uh, as i said the turbine components experience a centrifugal loads as it rotates and therefore the surface of the turbine that is the periphery of the turbine experiences uh, high cycle fatigue whereas the core experiences low cycle fatigue and the creep Uh, not only that in the case of turbine as it rotates the centrifugal loads uh, suppose if i design the turbine at yield strength suppose my yield strength is 250 mpa and if i design the material at uh, 200 mpa for example my design stress but actually if i see this uh, uh, during rotation sometimes because of over stressing the turbine the centrifugal loads exceed 25% that of the yield strength that means the stresses that uh, practically seen will be beyond the yield point because of this uh, over stressing during service therefore these effects have to be taken into account while uh, designing the material for the rotor it's not that yield strength governs the uh, design but over stressing will go beyond the yield strength therefore that factor needs to be figured in the case of turbine that is not written that is not uh, mentioned anywhere in the uh, asme course that is a code of practice that is being followed by several countries now uh, what we found is uh, in, in the case of uh, uh, 617 what we have seen is that yield strength is 245 but we can see here the material shows uh, uh, we assume that 10 power 7 cycles is the main, main requirement so we assume that it has reached infinite not infinite length but the design stress at 10 power 7 cycles so it is above the in fact yield point to about 248 the and what we observed is fatigue limit stress is 270 mpa so why this happens because it is in the dsc region that means the temperature 700 degrees centigrade is a dsc region so because of that the material is material has a inherently high temperature high temperature strength which is above the yield point but the designers doesn't take this fatigue limit as 270 because they never exceed the yield point so they still consider 248 as the yield strength of the material or fatigue limit stress but there is a margin because of the dsa that around 20 mpa margin has come because of dsa now uh, what is needed from the ice cycle side is uh, the hague diagram so in the the hague diagrams are plotted by plotting alternating stress on the y axis and the mean stress on the x axis 
and we generate the contours for a particular life for example 10 power 7 cycles 10 power 5 cycles and 10 power 3 cycles so the lowest curve what we have seen here is the 10 power 7 cycles so the uh, now yellow now the day, working stress is based on this uh, lowest curve corresponding to 10 power 7 cycles so anything beyond it will lead to the any combination beyond this line will lead to the failure of the material uh, beyond uh, less than 10 power 7 cycles and any combination of alternating stress and mean stress below this lowest curve will lead to a will, will at least give 10 power 7 cycles of life so this diagram now there is there has been a significant uh, uh, research going on how to modify this Hague diagram with creep effects now we are having a high cycle fatigue we are also having a creep but how to bring creep into the Hague diagram the this this uh, this kind of information is not available in the literature but what we have to do is on the x axis we have to limit the mean stress up to the allowable creep stress so in in this slide if you see the mean stress goes up to several values now when you when because mean stress acts continuously on the component so it introduces creep in the material therefore when we are designing uh, uh, hcf plus creep together the mean stress has to be restricted well below the allowable creep stress so that is how this is being uh, designed for the hcf plus creep interaction in the rotor components only for hcf we can straight away use this but in the case of uh, creep effects the creep has to be figured into the mean stress the, by cutting off the mean stress maximum value to allowable creep stress value next stress so now we have several joints in the uh, in the aos department one of the critical joint is a 617m forge and 10 chrome steel forge dissimilar weld joint this comes in the rotor side because ten uh, rotor has uh, two different temperature regions: a temperature above uh, 550 degrees centigrade and temperature below 550 degrees centigrade. So for the temperature above 550, we are using 617 rotor. But temperature below uh, 5, 550 or 580, we are using 10 chrome steel. So because of that, a dissimilar weld joint is inevitable, and therefore we need to study the weld strength reduction factors for this kind of joints. So the left hand side figure shows that uh, SN, SN, dot, SN curve data for different uh, materials. So the first one is for 617M, around 270 it shows. And whereas the uh, uh, 310 MPA it shows. And in the case of a dissimilar joint, it shows 180 MPA. That is 10 power 7 cycles comes at 180. And in the case of 10 chrome cell, it comes at 220. So what we have seen a uh, Western reduction factor is we have taken the ratio of endurance limit of uh, dissimilar joint, that is 180 MPA. We have divided that by the alloy 617, that is 310 MPA. And this comes around 0.58 uh, Wilson reduction factor. We, we can also take the 10 chrome steel, that is 220. But in this case, it, it comes around 0.8. But uh, it will not give any conservatism. So to have a higher conservatism on this joint, we have taken the ratio of 310 to 110, 180 MPA rather than 220 to 180 MPA in order to have a conservatism in this kind of critical joint. Similarly, we have established the well strength reduction factor for, uh, uh, for a 10 chrome steel also. So here we can see that in the well strength reduction factor in the case of creep, it changes with the amount of creep exposure. So till now we have reached, you now the tests are going up to 10,000 hours, but we have seen that well strength reduction factor saturated beyond 0.7. So there is no further increase uh, drop in the well strength reduction factor in the case of creep. Now we are using around 0 0.74 up to 10,000 hours. Next slide, sir. So not only the creep and fatigue data, uh, the uh, fracture mechanics data is also important, the crack growth and fracture toughness properties, essentially for the turbine side, the rotating components. So because the uh, we have seen that there is a dynamic loading always, therefore the fracture toughness properties plays an important role. And not only that, because of the uh, long service up to 25 years, service-induced degradation will take place. Therefore, the effect of thermalizing is also important on these properties. Next slide, sir. So I have presented only three slides on this. Uh, so what I have shown here is a fatigue crack growth data for LO 617M, is it at two durations, 5,000 hours and 20,000 hours. As you can see in the first figure, the fatigue crack growth uh, data is presented. Uh, we can see here that uh, delta K threshold, the threshold value is coming down with the increase in aging duration. So there is uh, some beneficial effect in the case of 617 because of aging, and we didn't see any degradation in the uh, 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 this K threshold value. 
Uh, similarly, the same thing is also observed in the case of 304 HCU. The threshold, uh, uh, delta K threshold has increased with increase in aging duration. But this favorable role should also be looked at from the fracture toughness point of view. So we have evaluated the fracture toughness. You can see the next slide. I think we should yeah. have some time so, for discussions. Yeah. yeah, so I think I have reached almost uh, last tens or two slides. So here we can see that, but in the case of fracture toughness, we have seen the degradation in the uh, fracture toughness values. And in the case of K1C, around 150 MPA uh, root root uh, 150 MPA root M is considered as the design value for the component. So we, we are able to reach at that value close to 150 150 MPA. And some of the values are derived from the J1C data. And what we found is that uh, uh, the tube and forge has a similar kind of fracture toughness. There is no degradation between them. Both show similar values. Even they are much above the literature data, what is shown on the left-hand side bottom. Next slide, sir. So we, now we have a project on from PSC office on uh, uh, this material ASTM B983. What we anticipate is when we transit from the, if you see the left hand side two figures, the first figure shows typically for 617 alloy, and the second figure shows the pipe thicknesses for 740, uh, 740H. When we transit from 617 to 740, we can have a huge savings on the amount of material because of the thinner wall sections. So this project is now being taken up by Isigard with the support of Principal Scientific Advisor Office. So this is going on. This could be in the meantime, before the power ministry Uh, takes a decision the developmental work on this may reach a conclusion in another one year next slide sir. so not only the uh, base materials there are uh, several tests are also conducted on welding consumables uh, they have passed by asm section 9 the root bend and face bend test they have done to prove that even after welding they don't crack so that's how these two figures shows the root bend test and face bend test without any cracks next slide sir So one of the critical technology, as I mentioned, is the dissimilar rotor welding between 10 chrome steel and 617. And this technology was developed and transferred to BHL. You can see here the BHL was able to develop this rotor with welding at the blacks. You can see at some locations it is welded. So this technology was completely transferred. Now they are able to produce the actual rotor with the dissimilar joints and 10 chrome steel at, uh, at their two extremes. We have a 10 chrome steel, and in the middle we have a 617. And they are able to develop this without any uh, cracks. They, it is fully inspected using NDE techniques. So to summarize, this is typically what uh, the materials that were studied at Isigar: LS six one seven in the tube form for boiler tubes, and six one seven in ten chrome in the forging form, bimetallic rotor, and six two five for bimetallic casing, and different weld joints among them. So all the NDE inspections, welding. And then uh, metal forming, characterization, testing, everything was uh, done at Isiga. Whereas BHL has taken up on jobs on uh, uh, turbine blades, water wall panels, and other materials. Uh, not only this, ASL, AOC also has constituted 32 projects with academic institutes and national labs. And we have about 84 major testing facilities were established at various institutions, and we have about uh, 1250 tests were conducted in all these testing missions. Which is being, which is now submitted to design team at BHL. Next slide, sir. So with this, I will end uh, my presentation. I I acknowledge very heavily and with respect to the forefathers of AOC mission at Isiga, Dr. Sri Kumar Banerjee, Dr. Baldev Raj, Dr. S. C. Chetal, and Dr. A. K. Bahadri. And the project was steered at Isiga by Dr. Jay Kumar, Dr. Amrendra, and Dr. Shahjoo, and now Dr. Devakar. So I, I also acknowledge senior scientists and several young researchers from MMG and IGA, members from BHL, NTPC, and also from several industries from NFC, Midani, and also from uh, testing institutes such as BIS, which has helped in the uh, uh, at critical times for many of the institutes and the C uh, CSR NML and Indian Academia. Thank you, sir. Thank you. That's all. Sir. This is a the summary for. Sir. Okay, so yeah, I'm sure. I think I'll uh, stop sharing. Okay, so I'm sure there are some questions from the audience, and uh, please uh, type it in the chat box so that we'll take one after another for answers.
so i think it went uh, i exceeded the time i feel <laughs> It's okay. I think this was one of the important topics and interesting topics. Uh, yeah, so see, I have uh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Reddy, I just wanted to ask you, see, when you are talking about uh, the strength as a function of temperature. Yes. For sir. Some of the, you know, if you look at the ASME curves, they yes, were like kind of as the temperature increases, it was flattening. That means mm. uh, it really doesn't matter whether you are at 850 or 900 or 950. Whereas yes, if yeah. you look at some of the materials that what we have developed, they seem to yeah. have a slightly different uh, response. Namely, there is a yes. steep drop in the strength as a function of temperature. Yes, yes, yes. So why is that? And uh, as a designer, how yeah. would you kind of uh, address this no, no, issue? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Even ASME also, ASME section 2D, also mm. provides allowable stresses as a function of temperature. Mm. So if you see those stresses, they also show a similar trend. That, that is, for 600, it will show, suppose, say, 100 MP allowable stress. At mm. 750, it will show 80 MP allowable stress. And at mm. 850, it will show 40 MP allowable So there is a drop also there also it will follow. Oh, OK. There is okay. no, that, that, that is section 2D we have to use. OK. And then the other thing quickly was that, uh, you know, your LMP parameter, was yes, uh, seemingly decreasing as you change the material from what was 20.25 it became yes, 17 yes. point something correct, correct so sir. what is its effect in terms of the long term because uh, you are looking for this uh, AUSC project to also work for yes, a very sir. long term right correct, and, sir, correct. i don't know 60 years or 80 years or whatever so how does it yeah, affect 25 years yes yeah yes. right so I, actually that uh, for austenitic stainless steels let me 304 hcu so yeah. these type of materials, conventionally and presently also, they all everybody uses this LMP constant as twenty globally. Mm. So, uh, but in the in the case of six one seven also, people use twenty, but mm. we we didn't use twenty because uh, we know that this kind of material is prone to some kind of precipitation in the long term. So there will be a degradation. So it is always better to use a lower LMP constant because it's a conservative. When you increase okay. LMP constant to higher values, it's not conservative. Mm -hmm. And in fact, whatever LMP constant we estimated from our data, it is matches closely with the ASME suggested value. Yeah, that I ASM know. Too, yes. So yes. that was one of the advantages of having a lower LMP value. That means it's highly conservative. Okay. I think Vikram has raised his hand, so maybe. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor. This is very, very exhaustive and interesting. Um, did I get it right that in the in the creep uh, analysis, the yes, short short term uh, failures were associated primarily with the primary and steady state, whereas the very long term failures were dominated by tertiary. That is depending on the stress levels. You, yes, you, yes. you had up to 100,000 hours, and then you had, you know, at higher stresses, failure at lower times. Uh, am, am I right in that uh, the longer times yes. were, were determined yes. more by the tertiary stage, and the shorter uh, times were determined more by the steady state? Uh, no, sir. Uh, actually, suppose if a material shows 1,000 hours, for example, it's a shorter exposure. It is essentially governed by tertiary creep. Suppose if a material is exhibiting 20,000 hours, it is essentially governed by steady state, steady state creep. And tertiary will be there, but it will not be a dominant one. Okay. So higher, the, higher stresses. Yeah, so in, when, when you, uh, you, you know, you develop models for, um, you know, life and time to rupture and so on. Is there a way in which you find that high stress, short time uh, data can be reliably extrapolated to uh, the longer times which are needed for design? I mean, uh, it's not easy yes, to do 100,000 hour experiments. Sir. Yes, yes. What, uh, as per uh, guidelines, we can extrapolate one order of magnitude. That means I should have a minimum of 20,000 hour data to extrapolate it to one lakh. Suppose okay. uh, you understood, no sir. Suppose uh, 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 I'll tell you, sir. Suppose if I am designing for a 25 years a component, 
I am designing it to a component for a creep for 25 years. Now, as per the design, I need a creep data one third of the 25 hour, 25 years. That means 25 years in, converted into hours. One third of that should be the minimum creep data required for a component design. Now that comes close to around one lakh hour for a 25 hour year component. It comes close to one lakh hour. Now one lakh hour data generating in a lab it takes 10 years, more than 10 years. Now what people do is. Um, since they can extrapolate one order of magnitude, provided there is no microstructural changes, whatever is happening at 1000 hours will continue to happen at 10,000 and continue to happen at 40,000 hours. If that is the case, we can extrapolate, suppose at one order of magnitude. I do test up to 10,000 hours, I can extrapolate up to one lakh hours, not beyond that. But now most of our data reaches up to 25,000 hours. Whatever our laboratory test we have done, we have about up to 25,000 hours data and we can easily extrapolate it to one lakh hours. But at the same um, temperature. Yeah, fine. Uh, just another quick question. Uh, the, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, there's, there's a lot of conservatism here because you get dynamic strain aging in situations which actually increases your strength as you go along. Yes, sir. Fatigue, fatigue limit stress. It's okay. safe. Yes. Is, is there a way of exploiting that during the processing and getting all those precipitates uh, uh, right at the beginning uh, by, by suitable heat treatment or thermomechanical processing? Uh, by DSA, you mean to say? Well, it, they, basically at those temperatures during service, you're getting precipitation, which is enhancing the strength. Not precipitation, so it's essentially DSA. Dynamic strainizing is essentially a dislocation solute atom interactions. Oh, I see that. Okay. Not not uh, not any precipitation of uh, no, uh, second no. phases. No, no, sir. Not precipitation. Essentially, it's okay. a uh, dislocation precipitate. I mean, uh, dislocation solute atom interaction. That is DSA. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I think. Uh, thank you. I think there is a question from Dr. Avishkar. Who has thanked you for the exciting presentation and he wants to know can we explore ceramic material for manufacturing tubes and he says ceramic materials can withstand high temperatures and show better corrosion resistance that's that's true sir actually uh, but the components design is uh, in the form of a tube or in the form of a, a valve so ceramic components in this use components may not uh, give sufficient ductility because they have their inherently they are brittle. So what they are doing is they are giving the coatings of this material on the tube surfaces, so which will resist them from uh, uh, corrosion and uh, corrosion type of related issues. But ceramic components as such cannot be used because the ductility requirements are very high for these high pressure systems. Okay. So then there is one more question. Uh, of course, one uh, uh, compliments from Dr. Sundar. He says, thank you yes. very much for your very lucid presentation. Uh, is it is allowable defect size a criterion for uh, in design or inspection of components? And if yes, how do we go about specifying or characterizing this parameter? If no, then he says, why not? So yes, sir. The, in yeah. Yes, uh, I agree with uh, you, Sundar, sir. I agree with you. In fact, uh, if I take a rotor of 8 nm diameter forging, so I don't have any technology now to detect the defect at the uh, center of the rotor. So it's a very uh, difficult for me. Suppose you, I'm creating a bimetallic. Uh, for example, we have a bimetallic rotor welding between 10 chrome and uh, 617. So what we have is that is a hollow weld because when we weld this uh, such a long uh, thick component, we cannot weld it. So what we have done is inspection will permit up to 250 mm thick uh, sections. So what we have done, we have created a joint which has a weld thickness of 250 mm, which can be inspected by the existing NDE techniques. So based on the existing NDE techniques, we have detected what is the typical crack that can be detected in such huge components. For example, in the case of casings, there is about 2 mm, close to 2 mm crack can be tolerated for, for as per NDE for a, such a huge casing. So like that, every component, they have a critical size of the crack, which can be uh, tolerated and it has been documented. And allowable stresses, allow, uh, 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 once a crack is present, the design is entirely different because it's based on the fraction mechanics. 
so fracture toughness and other parameters will come into effect uh, the, and it's essentially for only the rotating components this kind of uh, crack based design is basically taken into account only for rotating components not for the static components like casings are static so they don't rotate rotate so their design is different but for the rotas and all the things being rotating their design is based on entirely on fracture mechanics apart from the creep so both are taken into account I think, I don't know, Dr. Sundar, if he's there, he can. Yeah, uh, I, I was just wondering, uh, th thank you very much yes, sir. once again. Yes, sir. But uh, th that really didn't uh, entirely, uh, you know, address the question because, you know, if you, uh, supposing I, you know from your ND colleagues that, you know, 2mm is uh, something that is possible that yes. we'll miss it. How do you yes. then proceed to... Uh, determine that whatever design stress you have allocated is OK yes, for that sir. part till the next inspection. No, you it has to be proceed from, uh, you Correct. cannot go by fracture toughness. You'll probably have to go by threshold or by growth yes, rate sir. or something like that. Yes, right? sir. Yes, sir. The, what's the yes. procedure over there? Yeah, in fact, uh, they, they have done this analysis with IIT Roorkee professor. So they have assumed uh, some crack of around 2 mm or beyond that. And how to design based on this crack, they have done. But details were I was not having. Uh, oh, okay. okay. That's, that's, that's all right. But the so, important but, but thing they have is done that this it, analysis. it's given attention. It's given attention. Yes, that's yes, important. Yes, but essentially for this uh, rotating components, this was given attention. Okay. So if it's a rotating component, how many cycles do you expect to see between inspections? Yes, uh, if, uh, I think the, uh, the inspection procedure, uh, probably I, I do not know, but uh, they have the procedure. This and NTPC has the yearly inspection, some ND techniques they're using and seeing how much okay. crack extension or how much uh, things are happening. But okay. uh, as on today, I, I was not having the, those details with me. Oh, that, that's okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Maybe at a later but date we can it, catch you on this. Yeah, yeah. But this is a very important task because this is what, in fact, the Siemens has recommended. Uh, what you have exactly asked, you know, sir. The same thing the Siemens have recommended that this analysis has to be done for the rotating components since this becomes very critical during uh, inspection during real time. Right. Okay, thank this you. Is a, is... I have a vested interest in asking that question because, you know, in INSYS, we are working on a new standard testing practice for thresholds and okay, we'll be sir. coming uh -huh. out with, uh, with that procedure in the next um, month or two and starting a round robin to look oh, at nice. the reproducibility yeah. of test results and how it can be applied to design. So maybe okay. at that point, uh, we can interact and uh, there's somebody else who's interested and we can yeah definitely them. sir definitely it is uh, it's essentially for all the components irrespective of rotation or, yeah yeah, yeah. It, it's to apply fracture mechanics to to answer this question okay. and in fact uh, professor Raghu Prakash is just silent over there but he is overseeing this work so. <laughs> okay okay so you, you essentially, uh, our people are using like C star parameters together with the fraction uh, delta A by delta N data. Together that they have been doing this kind of analysis, but uh, how much the progress I'm not aware of. Thank you. I think there is one more uh, question uh, from uh, Atul who is asking, does any structural component in the power plant undergo or experience compressive creep? Yes, sir. Naturally, because the, the loading in actual components is complex. There is no uniaxial loading acting on any component. So you have a three-dimensional stress state acting at several locations and at constraints, essentially at constraints, you will see this kind of uh, compressive stresses coming in the uh, certain constraint. Now, so there you will see that a creep also happens in compression. Okay. So, yeah. Rangu, would I... you permit another question? Sure, sure. Which comes sure. out of this last uh, response. Okay. Uh, and the question is, can you tell us something about how constraint can affect creep stress? Because yes, sir. You, we study creep under plain stress conditions. Correct. Uh, would, Correct. would the same results apply when you have constraint? Actually, when we have a constraint, so what happens is laboratory, suppose if I take a, a solid specimen without any constraint, and if I take a, another specimen with a constraint, so 
so what will happen is in the case of a specimen without a constraint that is a notch for example notch gives a constraint when you have a specimen without notch the stress is uniformly distributed and there is no issue but when we have a constraint what happens is my uniaxial load is not actually the same value acting along the uh, longitudinal direction in fact the 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 uniaxial value along the longitudinal direction will be lower than the applied load because the stress is redistributed there in all the three directions so essentially your uniaxial stress is lower at the at the notch therefore your creep strength is increasing but ductility is coming down this this can also be verified from the notch test so we have done several notch tests with v notch and u notch what we have observed is the life is increasing with the notch with notches with with constraint but the ductility is severely affected why because the stress is redistributed at the notch which is no longer a value which is equal to the uniaxial stress it is lower than the uniaxial stress because of redistribution three directions so do you also have a what you call notch acuity curves for the creep uh, yes sir protection? yes sir. We, we yes yes we have a notch acuity ratio the creep life as a function of notch acuity ratio we have the data based on the data what we observe is life is good but uh, that's not correct because ductility also an important factor to be considered so the follow up will be supposing you have the notch acuity factor for fatigue and notch acuity factor mm -hmm. for creep uh, which one yes. is uh, more severe for for example uh, fatigue is a dynamic loading so we need to give priority to the fatigue fatigue loading okay okay no because but, when you are talking but, in terms of interplay between creep and fatigue with the notch acuity yes. then you yes, might yes. also have to look at this uh, interactions right no yeah but that interaction is considered in a different perspective that is the damage acute during creep mm. so the damage component only we will take including oh. the notch acuity effect similarly fatigue also the damage component is taken including the notch effect so that damage is taken into account as an interaction so there we include this uh, effects okay so yeah i think i don't see any more questions so it's also been uh, 7:40 so now i think we will kind of uh, thank uh, dr varprasad reddy for his uh, excellent presentation uh, Vikram, do you want to say? No, I thought Raghu, you might want to mention the next uh, two seminars, maybe. Either. Yeah, yeah, I, I will come to that. So, if you want to say uh, anything else, you can, uh, you know. Kind no, of... nothing else from my side. Uh, okay. Thank you, uh, thank you, yeah. Prasad. Very nice. Sir. So, thank so, you, uh, Prasad Reddy. Yes. And uh, thank you, sir. In fact. Nice, uh, sir. Uh, mm. No, in fact, I presented uh, a layman's picture of uh, what activities were carried out at IZGAT, but there's much beyond that, which I have not presented here. So, no, I'm sure that we can interact and, uh, you know. Yeah, in, in some other occasion, we can have a detailed work also. Yes. yes, yes. So thank you very much. So let's all kind of uh, congratulate. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Randy. And before I kind of uh, adjourn, uh, I would like to say that uh, we have started this uh, webinar series uh, of this uh, year. In fact, initially it was done by Dr. Professor Sumit Basu from IIT Kanpur, I think in the end of 2020, and he was taking it on till about uh, middle of 2021. So we started this in 2022 with uh, Professor Nesavik from uh, Mirk Academy UK, who gave a lecture in uh, April on the reliability aspects coupled with the life my, uh, predictions. So this has been the second one has been done by Dr. Varprasad Reddy. There will be a series of lectures we have already lined up. The next one will be done by Professor Chandra Kishan from uh, the Institute of Science, Bangalore, Civil Engineering Department. And after that will be on June, July 23rd. I think that's what is the tentative date. And after that we have lined up uh, uh, Professor uh, K. Ravichandran from University of Utah, uh, Salt Lake City. Uh, that will be in August. And September, we have uh, Dr. M. Uh, T. Shyamsundar, who was uh, ex uh, General Electric and IG car also. So, like this, we have lined up a series of uh, talks. So, I invite all of you to kind of uh, attend these uh, seminars and get benefited. Okay. With these few words, I think I will kind of uh, conclude this session. And thank you very much, Bharti, for uh, enabling this for this webinar and recording this also.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for giving me an opportunity. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sir. Vikram, sir, Sundar, sir, and Raghupakash. See you. See you. Yeah.